in the long run, there can be no joy for anybody until there is joy finally for us all when large numbers of people share their joy in common. The happiness of each is greater because each adds fuel to the other's flame. Joy is prayer. Joy is strength. Joy is love. Joy is a net of love that draws people in. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude. The best way to show our gratitude to God and the people is to accept everything with joy. A joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. Never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of the Christ risen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Hey to everybody watching online as well. Thank you for joining and worshiping with us. My name is Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here at First Temple, and I have to begin by saying thank you on behalf of my family. Uh, You may or may not know that a few weeks ago, my wife and I welcomed twins into the world. They came really early, and it was surprising and scary and beautiful, and I know that there are some people who will not listen to anything that I say unless they see baby pictures I have learned, so here we go. Uh, here on your left is my son, Avit, and on your right is my daughter, Lindy. They are doing awesome. We're so thankful for the crew at Scott and & White and how they have cared for them. They're still in the NICU, but they, they're coming home pretty soon, it looks like, and everything's going really well. So thank you for your prayers and your support. And now that I'm a dad of three, I've learned that equality is important. And so here's a picture of my oldest daughter, Junia. Uh, She's just excited to be a big sister, and I would not want to leave her out. It was Christmas time, uh, 2020, this last Christmas. And over the pandemic, you know, we wanted to travel and stuff, and obviously we couldn't do what we wanted to do. So we went to some like parks and stuff and got out Doors, and it was a great time getting to do that. My wife loves the outdoors and nature. She connects to God and his creation. And so she decided for Christmas that she wanted to get a bunch of camping stuff, right? That was all of her wish list for Christmas. We need some camping supplies so we could go camp together as a family. We got all this gear. We got a tent that had room for our dog. I mean, we got it all. It was awesome. And it was only A month or two after that, that we discovered that we were expecting twins. So if any of y'all need to borrow some camping gear, uh, it's going to be a minute uh, before we get to use it. And also, a couple months after we got all this camping gear, uh, the great big freeze fell upon us, as you remember. The earth kind of shut down here in Texas. Everything was frozen and cold, and we lost power at our house for a long time. And that first night, right, we were like, what are we going to do? So... I got my daughter and my wife to a friend's house that had power, and they were set up there, and then I decided I would go back home and try to ride it out with our dog and our cat, okay? So I brought a picture of the base camp that we built that first night. It was very cold, and my dog and my cat there were both very concerned, but you can see that there is light emanating from the center of the room there because we got a bunch of camping supplies, And so we had these cool battery-powered lanterns. And I will tell you, on that very cold night, I was grateful that I had a 70-pound scared husky dog with me and that I had a light. As we're reading this book of Philippians and talking about joy, we are listening to the Apostle Paul as he is writing to this church that he loves, and the reality is things are difficult. Paul finds himself in prison, and he is writing to this church that is dealing with their own conflicts and challenges. Maybe from the outside, certainly some from the inside, maybe they're afraid that what has happened to Paul will happen to them. 
right? And it has led to defensiveness and bickering and fighting to challenges. And so Paul is writing to them and he is encouraging them and he talks a whole lot throughout this letter about joy. In fact, the last verse that we'll look at today is in Philippians 2.18. He says to this church, You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way as me and share your joy with me. Perhaps as we think about the idea of joy right now, you may think this doesn't seem like a good time to talk about joy. In fact, this week as I was wrestling with the text, facing my own challenges, thinking about Philippians and joy, while my own circumstances were punctuated by the beeps and whirrings of hospital machines and hearing the alerts over the loudspeakers. How are we going to talk about joy? And as all of us together have been navigating our lives the last few weeks, and all the scary things going on in our world as we think about Earthquakes in Haiti, unrest in peril in Afghanistan, Louisiana and other parts of our nation recovering from a hurricane. And in our own community, we continue to grapple with COVID-19 and losses of life, exhaustion for our medical people. We're supposed to talk about joy? (laughs) Amidst all the challenge, joy. I'll admit that when we were planning this series months ago, we imagined that the fall would look different than it has been looking. But I believe that God was at work even then with us saying, yes, you need to hear about joy. You need to be reminded that Christian joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Christian joy is not about ignoring the pain or challenges in the world. It's not about pretending like everything is okay. No, it is a unique gift given to Christians that emerges when we grasp that despite whatever is going on around us, God cares and God acts and God is at work and God wins. There is joy. There is joy when we join in with the God of the universe who has solutions. So today we're going to talk about this light, this joy, this hope that Paul is able to grasp even in difficult days. We're going to see that we have been given the light of God not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the world around us. And we will see how we, despite the darkness around us, are invited to be people who light up the world. So turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12 and work our way all the way through verse 18 this morning. But first we start in 12 and 13, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. It'll be on the screens as well. It's also in the church app. Paul writes this, So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're thinking, wait, I thought we were going to talk about joy. That does not sound joyful at all. (laughs) What does that mean? Paul says, beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This passage has been challenging folks for a long, long time. And and maybe the first time you hear it or read it, you might think that what Paul is saying is, watch out. (laughs) If you don't do what you're supposed to do, God will zap you. That's really not what Paul is saying at all. Uh, In another letter to the church in Ephesus, He says, for grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. So when Paul says, work out your salvation, he is not saying you need to work for your salvation. 
You need to get to work to earn God's approval. And maybe you have heard that in your life or internalized that from some other experience you have that that I've got to somehow earn God's love and approval and I feel like I can never measure up. I want to tell you this morning (laughs) that the love and salvation of God is not something that we work for or we earn. It is a gift. Of God, And so if that's true, what is Paul saying when he says work out your own salvation? Well, that's the thing. Work out is not the same thing as work for. See, Paul is writing to people who are already following Jesus. And he's saying now, when things are getting difficult, it's so important that you continue to live in, you continue to practice, you continue to be shaped by the thing that God has given you. So the first thing we see here is that those who light up the world around them are first receptive to God's gift, right? Step one to living in a difficult world with joy is receiving God's gift and light and love. We can't work out what we don't have already. You will not be able to live with God's deep joy and light up the shadows around you if we have not received God's joy and his salvation from him. Perhaps that's what you need to hear first today. To live in a world that is difficult with joy starts when we confess that Jesus is Lord and commit to follow him with our lives. Paul said, you have obeyed before, and now I may not be around. Things may not just suddenly get better, and I get to come in and save the day. Paul is imagining that he may not make it out. So he says, keep obeying. Keep obeying and work out this gift that you've been given with fear and with trembling. And you're saying, okay, but what about the fear and trembling part? That doesn't sound joyful. This fear and trembling language, it comes from the Old Testament, and it's a reference to this idea of awe and respect, profound wonder at the bigness and the power of God. A few years ago, um, I had this incredible opportunity. If you don't know, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and if you are from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you do not have a choice. When you are born, you are christened a Steeler fan. So I'm a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I believe black and gold. I am sorry to offend you Cowboy fans. It's just the way it is. That's how we roll. They wrap you in like the black and yellow terrible towel when you're born. You just are a Steeler fan. And a few years ago, we found out that a Steeler legend was going to be here in town. In fact, Joe Green is native to Temple, Texas, and he is a legend in football. He is one of the greatest, probably the greatest Steeler of all time. Like, it was in the 70s, so you don't know the story, but like, imagine like the LeBron of the Steelers, okay? And he was going to be here in his hometown for a dedication of a field. And somebody hooked me up with tickets to be at the banquet with him. And I got to meet him. And I brought a picture of me and me and Joe Green. And I will tell you, when I was a kid, my grandpa would tell me stories about Joe Green and what the Steelers did like they were lullabies at night. And so I got to meet this man, and I shook his hand, and I'm a big dude, but his hand like engulfed my hand. I was like, I am so small in your presence. You can't really see the handshake because our former missions minister, Kay Bacon, is right there, but I promise. It was like, and in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, it's a legend. I can't mess this up. I can't say something dumb. I can't be awkward. In that moment... I was acting with fear and trembling. (laughs) I tell you this story because when Paul says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he is inviting us to remember the awe that it is to know God. (laughs) The bigness of the God who engulfs all of us. Man, we see this fear and language, trembling language, we're like, I don't know about it. And then we see a celebrity that we love and we're like, fear and trembling. Paul says, remember who your God is. Take this seriously. This is a big deal, this call to follow Jesus, obey. Not just when I'm around, but even more when I'm not. 
because salvation is not earned. It doesn't mean that God doesn't expect us once we receive his gift to then walk in his ways. We find that those who light up a dark world are those who are obedient to God's command. We are called to respond and live, responding to what God is calling us to do. And maybe today there is something that you know God is calling you to do, to say yes to, to say no to. That God is inviting you to something and And if we are going to light up the world, we must be obedient to what God says. You may be like, I have no idea what God says. Well, he says a lot to us in his scripture. Are we obedient to what God is calling us to? And maybe you think, okay, well, how will I do this? Listen, it takes effort, but I want you to know that you are not alone. In Philippians 2, uh, in verse 13, then it says, for it's God who's at work in you, both to his will to, do his, to work and for his good pleasure. So, so like we get to work on this and work out our salvation, but we are not alone and God is at work in us. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it when he says, work, work out your own salvation for it's God who works in you. It, it looks in one sense like we do nothing and in another that we do a lot. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but you must have it in you before you can work it out. Okay, so if we are going to be people who light up the world around us, that means that we've got to receive God's gift and light in us. We've got to obey his commands, and let's see what else he's going to tell us, and he's going to get specific. This is verse 14. Do all things without complaining or arguments. Excuse me? You can imagine when this letter first came to the church in Philippi, they likely all gathered together. Paul wrote a letter. Let's see what he has to say. And the messenger would have brought the letter out and been reading them the letter. And then the messenger would have said, and Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And you can imagine them standing there like, is he talking? What does Paul know? Is he talking to me? Does he know the thing that I said? Who is he talking about? Do all things without complaining or arguments or disputing. Verse 15, so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you will appear as lights in the world. Saying if you want your joy and your light to shine in the world, you better stop grumbling and speaking against one another and complaining and arguing. Verse 16, hold firmly to the word of life so that on the day of Christ, when Christ returns, I can take pride because I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even as I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with all of you. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. And that language about even as I'm being poured out as a drink offering, that is, that is weird to us today to hear that language. But what Jesse read earlier is the passage of Scripture that came right before this. It says, Jesus emptied himself out for us, poured himself out for us. And now Paul is saying, as I live and serve, I am pouring myself out for your behalf, for the sake of others. He is showing us what it looks like to receive God's gift of God pouring himself out for us in Jesus and then to be obedient and pour ourselves out to others. They would have understood this. He's saying, I empty myself out. I give myself for the sake of of God's work in you, and you know what? I rejoice. I want you to rejoice too. As we look at this idea that to be people who reflect the joy of God in this world, we've got to do all things without complaining and arguing, it may stress us out a little bit. Right? He's pointing out to this thing that must have been happening in this church where there is this dissension and childish infighting that has been damaging their credibility to those around them. To people on the outside looking in this community and saying, they fight just like everybody else. It looks like a reality TV show in there. Why would I care what they have to say? 
and the light that they have been given has become tarnished or blocked because of the way that they are treating one another. And it is likely that in their stress and challenges and the darkness that is around them, they have gone to become defensive. They have become fighting with one another, right? That is what we do when we are stressed. And Paul's reminding them, hey, you've been given this light. You're called to be obedient to what God is doing, and, and you've got to stop with the complaining and the arguing. Today, we might expect some other warning when we read verse 14, something that we would take maybe more seriously than we would about complaining or arguing, like violence or addiction or affairs. Paul's not saying those things aren't important, but he wants to draw their attention to this specific thing. Why? Because it's important too. And because it can be so destructive and so subtle, just picking at each other and complaining. As one teacher says, whining is not a spiritual gift. Something I, I am tempted to remind my toddler, right? Whining is not a spiritual gift. There's this story of a man who was spreading false rumors about his rabbi. And after uh, some time, the man became filled with remorse. And so he went to the rabbi and he asked the rabbi for forgiveness. And the rabbi forgave him and he said, Rabbi, I want to make this right. How can I make this right? So the rabbi told him, here's what you need to do. You need to go get a feather pillow. And you need to cut the end off the feather pillow. And on a windy day, shake out all the feathers into the wind. So the man did what the rabbi asked him to do. And he came back to the rabbi and he said, okay, now what do I do? And the rabbi said, now go collect all the feathers. <laughs> the man's heart sank. For the feathers had gone everywhere, of course. And so too, the rabbi declared, did the rumors and the lies go. And there was no getting them back. I tell you this story, and I, and I have to give a disclaimer. Right? There have been times where people have taken this scripture and tried to use it to cover up things like mistreatment or abuse within the church. And no, that is not what Paul is talking about. When there is injustice like that, we report it and we deal with it and we are transparent about it. That is not what Paul is talking about. What Paul is talking about is people just manipulating and pushing, waging political wars with one another with their words, of seeing one another as enemies, operating without grace. Why is this such a problem? Well, because if we are going to be a light of joy for our world, those who light up the world are people who collaborate. <laughs> there is collaboration with God's people when we light up the world. And see, the people were probably so worried because Paul had been such an influence in their church, such a hero to them, and his light was shining so brightly, and now maybe he won't return. <laughs> and they're likely thinking, how do we go on living <laughs> How do we go on pointing to Jesus when the person that has been like the key for us may not be around? And Paul says, I need you not to argue or complain. Why? Because together, when all of them reflect the light of God in this world, the light that they will shine is way brighter than anything that Paul could have done. That together, when their lights are all added together and they are not tarnishing one another, they have an impact in the world that explodes. We are stronger. We are united. The world around us that is so divided is so struck when we are united. When we do this, we appear as lights. We shine like stars. We are made to light up the world together. He reminds us of this call to be obedient, to not argue and fight, so that we are reminded that our obedience is not just about us. That the way that we live and the way that we act impacts our community. That the fighting that may have been happening in this church, people around were seeing it. It was damaging their credibility. We can forget 
that when we walk in ways that are not in line with the way God is calling us, we impact not just ourselves, but those around us and our community that we are in. Blameless living is never just about us personally. It's about how we impact one another. It's about how we walk together. There's this great African proverb that says, when elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Paul says, stop with the arguing, the complaining. As you guys go at it, you have no idea the grass that's being stepped on. Those who are hurting, those who are in need, those who are far from God, watching what you're doing and walking away. We are often unaware of what our actions can do to one another, even comments. Paul talks about the collaborative nature of our faith. So as we think about what it means to live in a way where we receive God's light and we are obedient to God's command and we collaborate together, it's important that we think about how we talk to one another. And so a pastor shared this helpful test that I found to be useful, um, and, and I want to put it up there. It's the think test before you say something. T is for is it true? Is it true? That's probably a good thing to ask about the things that you want to say, right? When you're frustrated or angry, you're like, man, these people got to hear this. Is it true? H, is it helpful? Is what I'm about to say helpful to anybody? I love I. I, is it inspiring? Is it inspiring? And is it necessary? <laughs> it's a lot we want to say that is probably not necessary. Is it necessary to say this thing? And K, is it kind? Is it kind? Now, of course, there are times when we need to call things out and stand up and say things that are difficult. And you know what? The most inspiring, helpful, kind thing we can do in that moment is to speak out. But to take these things and apply them to our words what would happen? The teacher says, and if what I'm about to say does not pass those tests, I will just keep my mouth shut. I have taken these uh, guides and tried to apply them to my social media presence. This test would be really helpful for us as we think about what to say and what to post. I have tweeted less because of this. <laughs> Is this necessary? No. Is this helpful? No. I hope that this would be maybe a helpful tool for you. We share this thing because we, like the church in Philippi, are navigating a world that is difficult and there are challenges. How will we walk? How will we live? How will we treat one another? People who light up the world around us with God's joy, we are receptive to his gift. We are obedient to his commands and we collaborate with one another. And then, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we join with Paul that we might rejoice in the same way and share joy with him. So it was a couple weeks ago, we found out that the twins were coming way too early. I was in a meeting, and Michaela, who works on our team, poked her head into the meeting and said, um, Brittany's water broke, <laughs> and I said, see ya. <laughs> I got out of that meeting. Before I made it home, a member of our church family was already at our house to sit with our daughter while we went to the hospital and figured out what to do. Every night since that day, 19 days ago, there's been church family members sitting at our house late at night after our daughter has gone to bed, making sure everything's okay and putting up with our very annoying dog every night. And these are people that maybe, some of them, I don't know if we would have met on the street that we would have hung out or been friends with. We, it crosses demographics and interests and all these things. And yet, in a difficult, scary time for us, we found that God's people joined in and showed up. And so as we navigate difficult times together, there is this vision of what God's people can do. 
when they say yes to what God is calling them to. When they say yes to what God commands and when they work together, not with a spirit of argument or complaint, but of love. So as we close today, I want to remind you of the light. Paul says, you will shine, you will shine in this generation. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have your phone, to take it out and turn on your flashlight. If you're with your kids, let your kids hold up that flashlight, and we're going to turn the lights off. And this can be a pretty dark room without the lights. We can go ahead and turn them off. No windows, no outside source of light. But something happens. When lots of people are united and reflecting the light of God into the world. Suddenly the darkness is driven back. And there's power when the people of God are together and united. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your light. A light that you have given us and a light that you invite us to share with the world. God, I pray that you would use us, the people of First Temple, to be your lights in this world, that we would respond, that we would be obedient, that we would be one. That in saying yes to Jesus and his gift, we would find that there is hope, that there is joy, even in difficulty. Because in the end, we know that you are victorious and your hope is for us. That when we obey, there is joy because we are doing exactly what you have called us to do and to be. God, may we obey whatever it is you are calling us to today. Whatever it is to say yes to or maybe to say no to. God, may you make us, help us, work in us so that we might obey. And God, may we unite. So that as we go out into this world, we each would bear your light and the darkness would be driven back. May we carry your joy into a world that needs it. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.